Not to breathe on the microphone too much. <laughs> um, my, name is, my name is Levine. Uh, I'm a biologist. I actually spend most of my time behind a computer, so um, I don't do much. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I am a biologist, but I spend most of my time behind a computer. In the next 45 minutes or so, I hope to show you um, why this is the case. You may wonder what this um, talk has to do with security. Uh, it doesn't have much to do with security. Uh, it has got a lot to do with hacking. It has a bit to do with computers, but mostly it has to do with yourself. Um, and with life in general. Uh, I want to address the fundamental question, uh, why is there life and why is it the way it is? If you think about it, uh, it seems that we know more about the state of the universe a picosecond after the Big Bang than we know about this curious creature, a slime mold. <laughs> now I try to figure out how to hold this and this at the same time. Um, just a second. Great. Um, one can always invoke one's deity of choice uh, to explain the existence of life. I will skip over that type of explanation because it has been done uh, quite a lot before. Um, and you can read about it elsewhere. I do have a belief that if God has created the world in seven days, he would not have had much time for debugging, which, which explains uh, many things, including this. I think I had a few of these in my tent this morning. Um, well, you could also ask your friendly neighborhood Darwinist. And he or she would probably say that's all due to evolution and natural selection, which of course still doesn't tell you why there are things to be selected in the first place. So then you can pick up a book on complexity and it will tell you that it's all due to emergence and it's all very complex. And it will go on about butterflies causing thunderstorms and the way in which ants look for food. And in the end you still wouldn't know why we are here and how we got here. So, you could ask me, and I would say, I don't know. But I have a nice story I can tell you, and it won't give you a full answer, but, uh, well, still interesting. <laughs> I'll start conveniently at the beginning, if I can find my mouse, map mouse, which is the Big Bang which doesn't really go bang, because there's no matter yet. Uh, it takes a few minutes for hydrogen and helium nuclear to form, and then um, about 360, uh, 300,000 years for atoms to form, and then a few billion years more to get small perturbations amplified and get galaxies. Well, and the first stars, and these can go supernova and produce the uh, the heavier elements that make up the more uh, rocky and uh, mushy bits of our solar system. And about um, 9 billion years after that, our sun and its planets have been formed from a large cloud of gas. As you can see here, I hope. Here we go. And there we have the solar system. Well, as we shall see, this energy from the sun is to become very important in sustaining life later on. But um, as far as we now believe, life actually originated uh, not at the surface, but uh, near the so-called uh, volcanic fence uh, we call black smokers these days. I'll skip this part.
Um, yeah, these vents provide lots of uh, building blocks for life and a lot of energy, especially in the form of high energy sulfide uh, molecules. And a uh, fairly protected environment as well. So it's not that hard to imagine um, the appearance of uh, the first metabolisms. So metabolisms are basically chains, chains of reactions that are powered by breaking high energy molecules. Um, and yeah, they can get coupled. And after a while you can get chains that, that start to replicate themselves. So they, they um, produce themselves from their constituents. We call these autocatalytic auto sets. And uh, you could consider it to be the most basic form of life. Well, when you have a bunch of these uh, self-reproducing chemical systems, you can get amplification, competition, natural selection, and they can get coupled and, well, basically, they can get more complicated. Um, now, after a while, you probably had a few of these, different ones. Closer? Okay. You probably had a few of these, uh, different ones of these, uh, like RNA and DNA-based uh, systems, and probably uh, some other ones we don't know about because they, uh, they went extinct. Um, and after a while, you might have had that some of these systems became enclosed in uh, lipid uh, vesicles, and you can get the first cells. Um, so, the first ones were probably driven by chemical energy, but not very long afterwards you would have had uh, evolution of um, systems that were capable of using sunlight, we call this uh, photosynthesis. And uh, these were actually, uh, well, they sort of changed the planet because they're responsible for the ex uh, oxygen atmosphere we have today. And they still power most of the, the processes that um, will power everything in nature, almost everything, and a lot of human society. Okay, so, but it's a long way from the, oh, <laughs> from the first um, single-celled organisms to um, human society, of course. In fact, uh, the first single-celled organisms didn't arrive until about 1.4 billion years ago. So the question is now, how do you go from a single cell to something like this, a wombat, or Richard Stallman? <laughs> and the answer is not easy. <laughs> um, but we're going to look at the basic ingredients of life and self-organization in general. And it turns out that self-organization is actually the easy part. Um, this may, may seem a bit counterintuitive. Because the second law of thermodynamics states that disorder always increases. And life is not actually, well, it's actually quite ordered. But that's only the case for closed systems. The Earth is an open system when it comes to energy. We receive lots of energy from the sun. And as long as this is the case, um, it won't reach uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. And stuff will happen, basically. So what kind of stuff? Um, well, in the presence of large energy gradients like this, matter can start to organize itself. And what kind of organization? Well, you can get um, all kinds of structures that try to get rid of this gradient. Uh, usually, more or less circular flows of matter that uh, try to transport the heat or dissipate it, as we say. And we call this convection. And it forms, um, well, sort of hexagonal structures we call convection cells. So this is a basic example of what you call a dissipative structure. Uh, There's a structure formed to dissipate uh, well, energy differences, basically. Um, and it's one of the most basic examples of self-organization. Oh, this is an animation which doesn't work like it should. These are, uh, well, the convection uh, cells forming. 
Okay. Now, instead of being dissipated by convection, um, solar or geothermal energy uh, can also be dissipated along other routes. For instance, uh, it can be stored in chemical bonds uh, and then be slowly dissipated through a series of exothermic reactions, which is not coincidentally uh, exactly what happens in living systems. So you could see life as a very large and complicated, complicated set of chemical reactions that uh, dissipate solar energy into heat. Okay, the opposite of this order is of course order. Um, and that's why information is sometimes called negative entropy or negentropy. Uh, and an energy gradient, um, for example, or uh, an energy potential for... Uh, for it's, uh, well, it's an ordered state. It has a low side and it has a high side. And it therefore contains information. And this, uh, as this gradient is dissipated, the information is uh, slowly lost. But because coupled chemical reactions can transfer free energy, uh, the thermodynamic information can be temporarily converted into all kinds of other, uh, other kinds of information. And this is the principal driving force behind the formation of complex structures and processes. Um, it applies that structures and complexity can arise as long as there is energy input. Because, well, without energy you would eventually end up here. And, uh, well, things would, the structure would more or less disappear. Um, it's basically what happens when you power down your computer, or if you stu uh, st stop eating for a few weeks. So, um, well, looking at, at, at it this way, living systems are basically just very complicated cycles of matter. Uh, and they're driven by the huge energy gradient that's um, provided by the sun. And the matter is constantly being recycled and it's temporarily stored in, well, mostly living systems and a lot of non-living systems as well. So thermodynamically speaking, it's not that strange we have life and complex structures. But energy is essential. Um, there are also a number of other processes that shape the patterns we see. And probably the most important of this is feedback. Uh, especially positive feedback. As most of you will know, uh, positive feedback is when a process has a positive influence on itself. So that it keeps amplifying itself. Um, and this way it can amplify small random differences for instance. And, um, well, it's responsible for anything from formation of galaxies to um, natural selection. And just as positive feedback is useful for amplification, negative feedback is useful, useful for um, stopping things from uh, getting out of hand. Um, well, negative feedback is, of course, when a process has a negative influence on itself, and then it's, well, it slows down or it stops. Well, feedback processes, processes seem to occur quite naturally in, uh, in nature uh, and therefore quite frequently and they're responsible for a lot of the, the non-linearity non we see in nature. And it turns out the combination of positive and negative feedback can create um, a lot of patterns. So in time, for instance, you can get oscillating patterns well, this uh, uh, electrical circuit that produces oscillations. This is um, an action potential, a neural pulse. It's also created by a combination of positive and negative feedback. And you can get all kinds of memory effects, called as hysteresis. Uh, much of this was first formalized in the 1950s by someone who I think most of you will know, Alan Turing. And um, he worked with a combination of mathematical equations that basically represent a combination of positive and negative features.